Shalom, family. Family, what you are about to watch is a dramatization of real events. I say dramatization because it is just that, a dramatization. I mean, without being there and seeing it for myself, I can't really, I can't really get things, you know, too specific. But using what information I have, what I can glean from the scriptures, family, you'll see that, well, I did the best I could with what I had. And family, I want you to know that even though some of the things that you might see might not be exactly as they occurred, the truths that are hidden within are spot on. And I hope this inspires you to pick up the text that I'm taking this from and to read it and to listen to the Holy Spirit and get some discernment. So family, I hope you enjoy what you are about to watch. This is little son Sabal Nabaya saying much love and much Shalom. The origins of shame and death, those formidable specters haunting the human experience, are shrouded in enigma. They are woven into the very fabric of our existence. To comprehend their genesis is to embark on a journey into the heart of the human condition. It is a journey back to the dawn of time, to the genesis of darkness, this is not merely a tale of ancient lore. It is a stark portrayal of the eternal conflict between light and darkness, a conflict that rages within each of us. By understanding the genesis of evil, we gain insight into our own vulnerabilities. We learn to recognize the subtle whisperings of temptation that are written in the Book of Remembrance. Today's tale come from the book of Remembrance of Moses, although the subjects of today's narrative were born long before Moses. This knowledge empowers us to resist the seductive allure of the shadows, to choose the path of righteousness. For in the understanding of our own capacity for both good and evil, we discover the how we should exercise our agency for good or for evil, finding the strength to overcome, to rise above the darkness. The story that unfolds before you is not for the faint of heart. It delves into the darkest recesses of the human soul. It lays bare the origins of our deepest fears. Yet within this chilling narrative lies a glimmer of hope. For it reveals that the battle between light and darkness is not a distant cosmic struggle, it is a battle fought within each human heart. And it is a battle that can be won. From the very beginning, humanity has been embroiled in a cosmic struggle, a battle for the very essence of our being. This is the story of that battle, the story of how innocence was lost and darkness gained a foothold in the world. It is a story of betrayal, temptation, and the seductive power of forbidden knowledge. But it is also a story of resilience, hope, and the indomitable spirit of humanity. For even in the face of unimaginable darkness, a single spark of light can ignite a fire. The characters in this saga are both familiar and strange. They are archetypes of the human experience, embodiments of our deepest desires and our darkest fears. But more than that, they are our earliest ancestors. Their actions became the source of truth, legends, and fables alike. From folk tales to biblical narratives, these truths were recorded on stone tablets to be interpreted in the Book of Remembrance for us to share in the experiences of those who came before us so that we may distinguish between the wicked and the righteous as we think upon the name of the Most High God, who is the great I Am Loving Kindness. Their stories serve as cautionary tales, reminding us that even the most righteous among us are vulnerable to the temptations of darkness. As you delve deeper into this epic narrative, prepare to confront the shadows within yourself. 
We must, by understanding the origins of darkness, be reproved and repent to overcome its power. Only then can we truly embrace the light. The sky was a brilliant blue, the sun high and fierce. Life in Eden was idyllic, untouched by the taint of death. Until the day the star fell, it blazed across the sky, a searing streak of fire, a portent of things to come. Kava, or the name most know her by Eve, was the first among mankind to experience fear from the sight of this fallen stranger. She had never witnessed such a sight. The air crackled with an unknown energy. A sense of foreboding settled over the land. The star crashed to earth with a deafening roar. The impact shook the very foundations of Eden. Trees swayed violently, their leaves raining down like frightened birds. The earth trembled, a deep, primal shudder. This was the first time such a thing had been witnessed. But we aren't here to that story. The part we are focused on today comes after Semihaza, who the world calls Satan, fell as the meteorite to the Eden. We only mention it because after Yatsakod and Kava, also known as Adam and Eve, sinned and were ejected from Eden into the temporal world that we live in today, Semihaza found a way to use Kenna, who we know today as Cain, to chant words of evil to bring another such meteorite crashing down upon his brother Matan Nia, who the world today knows as Abel. His death is where this story begins. There, lying amidst the shattered remnants of the fallen star, lay Matan Nia, his body broken, his life extinguished. The first taste of death had come to into the temporal world. Fear, sharp and cold, gripped the hearts of many of our earliest ancestors. They gathered around Matan Nia's still form, their faces etched with confusion and dread. What had happened? What was this strange stillness that had overcome him? They had no concept of death, no experience of its finality. They waited for Matan Nia to rise, to shake off the impact, to laugh and rejoin them, but Matan Nia did not move. Days turned into nights, and still, Matan Nia lay unchanged. His skin grew cold, his once vibrant eyes now vacant and staring. The terrible truth began to dawn on them. Matania was not coming back. A collective wail of grief arose from the people. The children, their innocent eyes wide with fear, asked their parents what it meant. Why wasn't Matania waking up? But the parents had no answers. They too were grappling with the incomprehensible. They all knew that Matanaya had ended, and they wondered if they would end too. Matan Nia's wife, Sefi, was stricken in her grief. Why isn't he waking up? What does this mean? In the midst of the shared grief and bewilderment, a darkness stirred. Kenna, Matan Nia's brother, the very one who had taken heed to Semihaza to cause this, felt a strange mix of emotions, sadness, yes, but also a twisted sense of satisfaction. He had been harboring resentment towards Matania. That was born from lust. He remembered how this had come about, how he had wanted both of the twins, Sefi and Azura, for himself. He wanted two wives, a wicked and perverse desire. Awan was his rightful rib, but he wanted more. He wanted the twins. He began to hear whispers, dark, insidious whispers that slithered into his mind, feeding his resentment, nurturing his hatred. The whispers spoke of power, of revenge, of a world where Kenna could have Sefi as well as Azura. Why should he be the one? You deserve more. You deserve everything. Kenna tried to resist, but the whispers were persistent, their allure intoxicating. He found himself drawn to solitude, to the shadows where he could indulge in his dark thoughts undisturbed. The whispers grew stronger, their hold on him tightening. Leave me be. But what if... what if they're right? He started to mutter under his breath, his words laced with venom. Changing words of hatred between clenched teeth was his contribution. The people around him, sensing a change in him, began to avoid him. 
Mothers clutched their children close when he passed, their eyes filled with apprehension. They don't understand. They never will. I can replace him. He needs to be replaced. Unbeknownst to Kenner, a malevolent entity was drawn to his burgeoning hatred. Semihazar, a creature of darkness, reveled in the negative emotions swirling around Kenner. He saw an opportunity to plant a seed, a seed that would grow into something truly wicked. Matania is holding you back, Kenner. He is the reason for all your unhappiness. Semihazar whispered to Kenner, feeding his anger, encouraging his darkest impulses. He told Kenner that Matania was holding him back, that Matania was the reason for all his unhappiness. He planted the idea of a new name for Matania, a name dripping with disdain and malice. Abel. Yes, Abel. He is nothing but a replacement. Kenner, consumed by his hatred, latched onto the new name, Abel. A name that signified replacement, a desire to erase his brother's very existence. He repeated it over and over, each utterance a curse, a manifestation of his growing darkness. Abel. 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 And as Kenner succumbed to the whispers, another stone fell from the heavens just like it had in Eden. Only this time it wasn't the trees at the grass that had been disturbed, but it was Matanaya himself who this meteorite came crashing upon. And it was this death that brought about the mixed emotions that Kenner was feeling. New and terrible emotion was born within him, an emotion that would plague him and all his descendants, the emotion of shame. What have I become? The reality of Matania's death settled upon the people like a shroud. Fear, a new and unwelcome companion, took root in their hearts. The whispers in the shadows seemed to carry an ominous chill. They had witnessed the fragility of life, the sudden brutal transition from vibrant existence to cold, unyielding stillness. The knowledge of their own mortality, once a distant concept, now pressed upon them with suffocating weight. The children, their innocence shattered, looked to their parents for answers. Would they too be struck down by a falling star? Would their laughter be silenced, their games abandoned? The parents, their own hearts heavy with dread, could offer little comfort. The world, once a place of wonder and delight, had taken on a sinister edge. The shadows seemed to deepen, the silence punctuated by unspoken fears. The knowledge of death, once hidden, now cast a long and terrifying shadow over the temporal world. Sefi, Matania's wife, was inconsolable. The pain of his loss was a physical presence, a crushing weight that threatened to suffocate her. She wandered through their dwelling, her hands trailing over his belongings, each object a searing reminder of what she had lost. Oh, Matania. How can I go on without you? Her cries of anguish echoed through the once happy home, a heart-wrenching symphony of despair. The other women gathered around her, offering what comfort they could, but their words seemed hollow and distant. Nothing could penetrate the wall of grief that surrounded Sefi. Why him? Why now? Days turned into nights, and still Sefi's grief raged unabated. The spark that had once animated her had been extinguished, leaving behind only an empty shell of despair. The people worried. They had never witnessed grief so profound, so all-consuming. They feared for Sifi's sanity, for her very life force seemed to be draining away with each passing hour. I can't... I can't do this without you, Matania. Let us again visit the dark path that led to Matanaya's demise, as Kenner retreated further into the darkness that had ensnared him. The whispers of Semihazar grew louder, more insistent, urging him towards the terrible act. They promised him power, dominion, and the fulfillment of his deepest desires. Semihazar knew how to exploit Kenner's weaknesses, his envy, his lust, his yearning for recognition, 
he painted a seductive picture of a world where Kenne had the objects of his desire. Embrace the darkness, embrace your hatred, your envy, your desire for revenge. They are your true power, the keys to unlocking your destiny. Kenner, his judgment clouded by hatred and despair, listened intently. He craved release from the turmoil within him, a way to silence the hate that gnawed at his soul. Semihaza offered him a way out, a dark and terrible path to liberation. I, I don't know if I can... Kenner, his heart pounding with a mixture of fear and anticipation, hesitated. He should have known that the path Semihaza offered was fraught with peril, but the allure of power, the promise of getting what he coveted, proved too strong to resist. What must I do? He had crossed the line, stepped into a realm where there was no turning back. The die was cast, the bargain about to be struck. Simple, you must embrace your new name. You must embrace a new identity. You must embrace hatred and chanting through clenched teeth. You must become Cain. And with those words, the seeds of manipulation were sown. Kenner, consumed by darkness, took the first step on a path that would lead him away from the light and bind him to the will of Semihazar. The name Cain hung in the air, heavy with malice and foreboding. Over and over again, he repeated dark mantra, but as he repeated it again and again, as Semihaza urged, a chilling transformation began to take hold. His hands, once gentle and calloused from tending the gardens of in the temporal world, now clenched into fists. His brow furrowed, etched with a permanent scowl. His eyes, once filled with warmth and laughter, now burned with a cold, unsettling intensity. My love for Matanaya, twisted by Semihazar's whispers, curdled into a venomous hatred. I replayed every perceived slight, every jealous pang, every moment of resentment, fueling the inferno that raged within me. The whispers intensified, no longer content to linger at the edges of his mind. They wormed their way into his thoughts, his very being, a constant reminder of the darkness he had embraced. He was no longer Kenner, the grieving brother. He was Cain, an instrument of wrath consumed by the fire of vengeance. Semihaza watched Cain's transformation with a perverse satisfaction. The seed of darkness he had planted had taken root, its tendrils wrapping tightly around Cain's soul. He reveled in the raw, untamed power that emanated from the tormented man. Yes, let the hatred flow through you. It is your birthright, your weapon against the weakness of your former self. Cain, lost in the throes of his transformation, barely registered Semihaza's words. He had become a vessel for the entity's will, a puppet dancing to the rhythm of ancient evil machinations. A pact was forged in that moment, unspoken yet unbreakable. A covenant of darkness sealed with Cain's despair and Semihaza's insatiable hunger for rebellion. The world, once a sanctuary of innocence, had taken its first step towards a future stained by sin and shadowed by death. The weight of his transformation pressed down upon Cain, a suffocating shroud of guilt and self-loathing. He had become a stranger to himself, a monstrous reflection of the darkness within. He wasn't behaving like a sweet reed anymore. Shame, like a venomous serpent, coiled around his heart, squeezing the life out of him. The whispers, once intoxicating, now mocked him, their every syllable a searing indictment of his betrayal. I had sacrificed my very soul for a power I barely understood, a vengeance that tasted like ash in my mouth. He looked upon the grieving Sefi, 
her pain a mirror reflecting his own monstrous actions, and the full weight of his sin crashed down upon him. He had traded his brother's life for a lie, a deceitful bargain that had cost him everything. He hadn't known was death was and did not wish it upon his brother. He had wanted to replace his brother, not end him. The world around him seemed to warp and distort. The vibrant colors of the temporal world were now muted and gray. The air hung heavy with the stench of decay, a constant reminder of the death that he had brought into the world. Now, Cain, you see the true price of your transformation. The people around Cain, sensing the darkness that clung to him, recoiled from him in fear and disgust. His presence was a blight upon their once perfect world, a constant reminder of the fragility of their existence. Whispers of banishment spread like wildfire. The murderer, the betrayer, the embodiment of their newfound fear had to be cast out. I was a danger to them all, a poison that threatened to infect their paradise. Cain, his spirit broken, his soul stained with sin, did not resist. He accepted his exile as a just punishment for his transgression, a penance he would carry with him for the rest of his days. And so Cain departed, accompanied by his Ribawan and the fallen watcher Semihazar, his constant companion who followed after him to feed on his shame like a vampire does blood. His tormentor, his dark lord, the world beyond Cain's family was vast and unforgiving, a wilderness teeming with unknown dangers. But for me, it offered a twisted solace, a sanctuary from the judging eyes of my former kin. This world is yours now, Cain, a kingdom of shadows and sin ruled by those who embrace the darkness. As Cain fled, the weight of his actions pressed down upon him. The whispers of Semihazar, once intoxicating promises of power, now echoed with mocking laughter, amplifying his despair. Each step took him further from the family he had lost, deeper into the desolate wilderness that mirrored the wasteland of his soul. I was consumed by a new and agonizing emotion, shame. It was a searing brand upon my soul a constant reminder of my betrayal. I had tasted the forbidden fruit of hatred and reaped a bitter harvest of remorse. Semihaza, observing Cain's torment, was intrigued. He had witnessed many forms of darkness, rage, envy, despair. But shame was a novel discovery, a potent elixir that promised a new level of manipulation. Cain's shame, raw and visceral, was a feast for Semihazza's malevolent spirit. Shame, I realized, was not merely a consequence of wrongdoing. It was a weapon that could be wielded, a poison that could be instilled to break even the strongest will. Semihazar, ever the opportunist, saw the potential in this newfound weapon. He observed how Cain's shame festered, how it twisted his thoughts and actions, driving him further into isolation and self-loathing. This, he realized, was a power unlike any he had encountered before. The whispers began to change, their tone shifting from encouragement to insidious manipulation. I no longer focused on fueling Cain's hatred, instead I nurtured the shame, feeding it with reminders of his sin painting vivid pictures that kindled the shame flame. Eventually I would discover that the ultimate end of shame is death by suicide. Surely I was meant to be God, that's why my mother was a comet. I have seen countless worlds and a god am I. 
My spirit already broken, I offered little resistance. I believed Semihaza's every word, accepting my torment as a just punishment for my actions. I became a prisoner of my own guilt, unable to escape the suffocating grip of shame. Semihaza reveled in Cain's torment. He delighted in the way shame twisted Cain's features, how it poisoned his every thought, how it transformed him from a being of light and love into a creature of darkness and despair. As time passed, Semihaza honed his mastery over shame. He discovered that it could be cultivated in countless ways, through lies, betrayal, manipulation, and the relentless erosion of self-worth. I became an architect of shame, building elaborate structures of guilt and self-loathing to trap my victims. I realized that shame thrived in darkness, in secrecy and silence. Semihaza the Satan encouraged Cain to hide his sin, to bury it deep within himself where it could fester and grow, poisoning everything it touched. Cain, following Semihaza's whispers, retreated further from the world. He and Awan were unruly to each other and the Irkadeshi, who are known as the Holy Watchers, were grieved at the disrespect they heard emanating from the two of them. A major portion of Cain's legacy in this way became shame, and Semihaza, with his hunger for power insatiable, looked beyond Cain, his gaze sweeping across the nascent world, searching for new souls to ensnare new victims to sacrifice at the altar of shame. He had tasted the power of this insidious emotion and he craved more. With each passing season, Cain's shame deepened, its roots burrowing into the very core of his being. He became a shell of his former self, a hollow vessel filled with self-loathing and despair. Cain became my master because he had the shame I lusted for. And so the seeds of shame sown in the fertile ground of Cain's despair took root and flourished, spreading their poisonous tendrils across the world, forever tainting the hearts of humankind. While Semihaza reveled in Cain's shame, Another dark entity observed these events with a different kind of hunger. Asal, also known as Azazel, a being of primal instinct and insatiable ambition, had been lurking in the fringes of creation, drawn to the escalating chaos. I watched with cold, calculating eyes as Matania fell as death claimed its first victim. The concept of mortality, of life extinguished, sparked a perverse fascination within me. I saw not tragedy, but opportunity. Asa El had long envied the power wielded by the creator of humankind. He craved dominion over something tangible, something he could shape and control. Death, he realized, was the ultimate power, the great equalizer that rendered all beings, even the seemingly invincible, vulnerable. I watched as Semihaza whispered to Cain, as hatred and shame took root in the hearts of men. But while Semihaza delighted in the slow, agonizing torment of his victims, I sought a more immediate, visceral form of power. Death, Arcel realized, was always accompanied by fear. He saw the terror in the eyes of those who witnessed Matinia's demise, the way it spread like a contagion, poisoning their once carefree existence. Fear, he concluded, was the key to controlling the hearts of men. He observed the growing conflict that came from lusting over a woman, the jealousy, the anger, the simmering resentment. He saw how these emotions left unchecked could escalate into violence, into a primal struggle for dominance. And in the heart of that chaos, Asael saw his opportunity. 
He would become the master of fear, the orchestrator of death, the one who profited from the bloodshed and suffering of others. He began to whisper his own dark desires into the fabric of creation, his voice a low, guttural growl that promised power and dominion to those who embraced his brutal vision. He would offer a different kind of pact, a covenant forged in blood and fire, a path to power paved with the bones of their enemies. He envisioned a world where women were not revered for their nurturing spirits and gentle wisdom, but coveted as trophies, as objects of conquest. Their allure used to manipulate and control the hearts of men. He would foster depravity and inordinate affection because of how much he hated the sanctity of marriage. Woe is the man who finds a wife that has been sent by Acel. He would become the patron of warlords, the master of seduction, the one who understood the intoxicating power of desire and the intoxicating allure of fear. He attacks marriage by way of security. He whispers to men that they need violence for security and he whispers to women that they need makeup to feel secure. His words are entertained by many who don't even know that he's a threat. He whispers in the shadows, planting seeds of discord, fanning the flames of lust and envy. He spoke of conquest and dominion, of the thrill of the hunt, of the intoxicating power that came from subjugating others. And in the darkest corners of the world, far from the fading light of truth, his whispers found fertile ground. Men, driven by greed, ambition and the insatiable hunger for power, listened intently their hearts enticed by the promise of a different kind of paradise, a kingdom built on conquest and ruled by might. As Semi Hazar reveled in the slow, agonizing torment of shame, Asael rallied his forces for a different kind of war, a brutal struggle for dominance fueled by fear, lust, and the intoxicating allure of death. The world, once a sanctuary of innocence, was now a battleground for two competing visions of evil. Semihaza, the master manipulator, the architect of shame, sought to ensnare the souls of men, to bind them to his will through guilt and self-loathing. He delighted in the slow, agonizing erosion of their spirits the way they became hollow shells of their former selves, puppets dancing to the rhythm of his whispers. He would be known by many names, Satan and Lucifer being chief among them. Asael, the warlord, the master of fear, craved a more immediate, visceral form of power. He sought to conquer and control, to bend the world to his will through brute force and the strategic deployment of terror. Asael reveled in the clash of steel, the cries of the vanquished, the tangible evidence of his dominion over life and death. He would be known as Azazel, Abaddon, and Belial, and so from the ashes of sin, two empires of evil arose, each seeking to claim dominion over the hearts of men, Sinasio, the kingdom of shame, a realm of shadows and whispers where souls were slowly consumed by their own darkness, and Shakath, the pit, the warlord's domain, a land of blood and fire where might made right and fear was the ultimate weapon. Their conflict, born in the crucible of humanity's fall from grace, would rage on for millennia, shaping the destiny of humankind, a constant reminder of the seductive power of darkness and the eternal struggle between good and evil. The tragic tale of Matan, Nia, Cain, Semihazar and Asael serves as a chilling parable a stark reminder of the enduring conflict between light and darkness that has plagued humanity since the dawn of time. It reveals how quickly paradise can be lost, how easily innocence can be corrupted, and how deeply the seeds of evil can take root in the human heart. The origins of shame and death, as depicted in this ancient narrative, are inextricably intertwined with the emergence of free will. When humanity was granted the power to choose its own path, it also inherited the capacity for both great good and unspeakable evil. The whispers of temptation, 
embodied by the insidious entities Semi Haza and Asael, who are only two of the leaders of the Dekadaki, have echoed through the corridors of time, their allure as potent today as it was in those early days of creation. The names may have changed, but the forces of darkness remain the same. They prey on our vulnerabilities, our fears, our deepest desires, whispering promises of power, revenge and forbidden knowledge. They offer false solace in the shadows, urging us to embrace our darkest impulses, to surrender to the seductive allure of the abyss. The legacy of Cain, the first man to succumb to the whispers of shame and violence, serves as a cautionary tale. He reminds us that even the most righteous among us are capable of great darkness, that the path to hell is often paved with good intentions, and that the price of vengeance is often our very soul. Yet, even in the face of such overwhelming darkness, the story of our origins offers a glimmer of hope. For just as darkness took root in the world, so too did the seeds of truth, the unwavering belief in a power greater than ourselves, a light that could pierce even the deepest shadows. The very act of remembering this tale, of passing it down through generations, is an act of defiance against the forces that seek to enslave us. It is a reminder that we are not alone in our struggle, that others have walked this path before us and that their courage can inspire our own. The story of Matan Nia, the innocent victim, reminds us of the inherent goodness that resides within us all. He actually went on to become Cain's abiding angel, but that is another story. His willingness to forgive, his unwavering love, stands in stark contrast to the darkness that consumed his brother. It is a testament to the enduring power of compassion, the transformative potential of grace, and the hope that even the most broken heart can be healed. The battle between light and darkness, between good and evil, is far from over. It rages on within each of us, every day, a constant struggle for the very essence of our being. But armed with the knowledge of our past, inspired by the sacrifices of those who came before us, and empowered by the enduring strength of the human spirit, we can choose to walk in the light. We can choose to resist the whispers of temptation, to embrace compassion over hatred, and to build a world where shame and death are not the final word. I hope you enjoyed this tale. It was taken primarily from the Book of Remembrance of Moses, but also a little from the Book of Remembrance of Enoch and the Book of Remembrance of First and Second Aki. Please like and subscribe for more. If you like this presentation, I will try to do more like this. I pray that you found this edifying. This is Little son Sabal Nabaya saying much love uh, and much shalom. You are invited to come home to a God of loving kindness, even one whose name is Anoki said. You are invited to venture out of your lonely and distant lives into a life of fellowship to learn the value of the ways of Abraham. You are invited to walk in the covenant that was laid down for Abraham by his mother. You are invited to come home and find rest. You are invited to find hope for your future. You are invited to venture into the calm and still water of life with reproval, repentance, and forgiveness. From the Book of Remembrance of Moses And Moses said, I do not even know what they will call your name. Who should I tell the spokesman it was that sent me? And the Lord said, Tell him that the great I am loving kindness has sent you, for they know me by that name. And Moses wept, and he said, 
The children of Israel will not hearken unto my words, for I am nothing before all men. And the Lord drew near, and he said, Arise, my son, and pray whatsoever you will, and it shall be done according to your word. And all the Irkadeshi will obey you, rivers will obey you, the clouds and the wind will obey you, the mountains will heed your words. And when the house of Israel shall behold all these things, surely they will give heed unto your words, for you are called and have been ordained after the order of Melchizedek, and I am your God. And this day know that I will go before you. This day is the beginning of the time of decision for the house of Israel. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey.